The warriors of Arryn were all wearing similar armor by the time Don arrived at the north end of town, but they were definitely still divided into two distinct groups. One group was armed with swords, while the other one had mainly throwing knives and arrows. The second group also had two ballistae on their side. The ballistae were very big. They must have each required a team of horses just to pull them into position, but they were very impressive to see. Troma hadn't had anything like those ballistae, and Don could already see why Harold had been so upset to find that his had been sabotaged. The ballistae were large contraptions made out of wood and metal, which were apparently able to launch large destructive bolts through the air at the enemy, like massive crossbows combined with catapults. Don could even see some of the wooden bolts that were used off to one side, and they were as large and thick as tree trunks. He couldn't imagine anything being hit by one of those and living through it. Quickly, with all the skill that he'd spent the last three months in trauma developing, Don started scaling the wall, using the cracks and weaknesses in the wall to support his weight. Making difficult climbs and leaps had become Don's primary skill since he'd left trauma, and before long he'd gotten his hands on one of the wooden outcroppings on top of the wall. The outcropping stuck up almost three feet over the rest of the wall, and it had clearly been designed as a sort of wall support. But for the moment, Don hid himself as best he could in its shadow, watching Arryn's troops appear for battle. By that point, over seventy soldiers were gathered at the city's north gate, looking out towards the cliffs in the distance just like Don was, although from time to time, signs of discontent were visible among the troops. Nobody seemed less contented than Antoine or Harold, though. They were each standing at the head of half the troops there, and they were clearly arguing loudly with one another. Don couldn't hear much of what was being said between those two, but he did pick up on bits and pieces of the argument. It sounded like Antoine was convinced that Harold's troops wouldn't be able to get close enough to attack, while Harold was accusing Antoine of betraying Arryn's fighting tradition, telling him that he had no right to fight for Arryn. The whole thing was a big sad mess, just like Sylvia had said. It seemed like those two would just keep shouting at each other forever, as if nothing could ever distract them from their little world of conflict with each other. But at last, the ground started to shake, and the two fighting masters paused just a little in their bickering. That was when an enormous, deafening shout was heard all across town. It sounded like a giant screaming a war cry, and it was a cry that was filled with pure bloodlust and the craving for battle. Don swallowed hard when he heard that shout, because somehow he knew that it belonged to Grant. For several more seconds, the earth continued to shake, and by that point, everyone had fallen silent, even Harold and Antoine. Clouds of dirt started to rise into the air as the battle cry ended, and at last, when the vibration stopped and the air cleared, there was a man standing north of the entrance to town. That man was definitely very big, over seven feet tall, in fact, with broad shoulders and large muscles, and the animal fur that he wore over his shoulders and his thick brown hair made him look even bigger. A large sword rested in a hilt that hung from his belt, and a broad axe was strapped to his back. On top of that, his black, heavy-looking boots nearly started shaking the ground again as he got closer to Arryn. Soon, Grant was within ten yards of the army of Arryn, but for some reason he was squinting, as if he was trying to make something out. Finally, however, the eager look that had been on his face seemed to fade just a bit, and he looked upward into the air, apparently sighing. Only a moment after that, to everyone's surprise, he was removing the sword hilt from his belt and tossing it to the ground, then undoing the strap of leather that was keeping the axe tied to him as well, and he even removed the fur that covered his shoulders and chest. It was bizarre, because it was almost as though Grant was playing some kind of game with Arryn's army. For a few moments, everything was completely silent, and Don could have heard anything that was said by anyone in the army. In fact, one of the soldiers spoke only a moment later, sounding terrified, and sure enough, Don heard his question loud and clear. I don't get it. What's he doing? However, it was obvious that Grant had heard that question too, because in only a moment he looked up with a grin on his face and replied to it. I came here to fight with a great warrior, maybe one day to be beaten by one. Against that great warrior I'll wield my weapons with all the skill I've mastered. But weapons require care and maintenance. Using them dulls them, and it takes work to sharpen them again. I refuse to use them against anyone who isn't a true warrior. What? Antoine asked furiously, though sadly, Don understood exactly what Grant was saying. There are no true warriors here, Grant barked directly. You're nothing but a rabble, concerned only with yourselves and your own thoughts. I won't waste my weapons on weaklings like you. The moment that Grant said that, however, Antoine waved his hand forward in a signal, and just like that, the ballistae fired and two massive wooden bolts had been shot at the attacking warrior. However, at the moment when it seemed like they were about to hit him, Grant slid down onto the ground on his back, dodging the points of the bolts very effectively, and seized them from underneath with his bare hands, digging into the hard wood. For a good ten feet, the large wooden projectiles continued to drag Grant along the ground, but finally he dug his heels in and righted himself, huge log-sized shafts in each hand. 
Every man who'd watched him do that had shuddered, and Don could tell why. No other man in Arryn would have been capable of such monstrous strength or agility. You're treating battle like some kind of game, Grant exclaimed, a scowl spreading across his face. Trying to win like a child would, with stronger toys and bigger weapons. Against a real warrior, they don't mean a thing. Then, as if to demonstrate his point, Grant hurled one of the log-like bolts back towards the ballista it had been fired from, and the other one towards one of the town's protective walls. The first huge bolt splintered the ballista that it had been fired from, and the second one hit the wall full force, cracking stone and crumbling the wall's supports. Don hadn't even had a moment to react when the log-like bolt had crashed into the wall, but as the wall itself started to crumble, forming cracks of sharp, jagged stone as it fell away, Don knew that he had to make a move, because that was the section of the wall that he'd been crouching on top of. Quickly, Don scrambled upward along the falling, crumbling rocks until he could get a hold of a firm section of the wall, though he moved closer to one of the wall supports just to be safe. Obviously, he noted, Grant was inhumanly strong and surprisingly quick for someone of his size. However, what had really surprised Don was that the bolt had hit so close to the one section of the wall where he'd been sitting. For a moment, he wondered if Grant had noticed that he'd been there somehow and attacked out of instinct. Curiously, Don looked out from the shadow of the wall and realized in dismay that there was no doubt about it anymore. Grant was most definitely looking in his direction. However, that wasn't what worried Don most. When Grant had been looking at the soldiers and insulting them, there had been a scowl on his face. But when he stared at Don, a vulnerable little boy who didn't even know how to defend himself, he grinned. It was terrifying because Don knew what kind of sorcery had reanimated Grant, and that grin couldn't possibly have been wholesome. However, just as it seemed that Grant was about to head right for the place where Don was hiding, Harold charged towards him a lot faster than Don had ever seen anyone run. He had a sword in one hand and a helmet on his head. There was also a good deal of chain mail on his torso and arms, and he wore sturdy-looking leather gloves and boots. In a flash, Harold had swept his sword to one side across Grant's flesh, but it only left a very shallow cut where it hit, refusing to go any deeper into his skin than the first few layers. The damage that Harold had done with that swipe could hardly even be called a flesh wound. Quickly, Harold jumped back and put both hands over the hilt of his sword, attacking with his full strength and applying more pressure. However, it seemed that Grant had realized that because he was reacting to Harold's sword swipes quickly and easily, dodging every last one with a speed that was almost unbelievable for someone with such a large muscle structure. In fact, Grant seemed to be enjoying himself because he was continuing to grin broadly as he dodged Harold's futile attacks, and he wasn't even winded. You're very fast, Grant said even as he dodged Harold's attacks. But I can predict everything. Something's made you angry, and you brought that anger out here. No true warrior would make that mistake. After those last few words, Grant almost seemed to chuckle, and in a moment he'd clap both hands together in front of him, seizing the blade of Harold's sword. Harold's eyes widened as Grant yanked the sword blade off to his left for a moment, then swung his right hand back around, knocking Harold clean off his feet with a backhanded punch. The blow had obviously been intended to focus most of its force on the unshielded areas of Harold's head, since his helmet had only been dented in two places, and he looked like he'd been kicked by a mule. Less than a second after Harold had hit the ground, however, the undead warrior seized his helmet with one hand and tore it off, still grinning like a madman. However, just then, a series of hissing noises sounded as Antoine began his attack. Antoine's weapons of choice were typically long-range, and while Grant had been removing Harold's helmet, Antoine had fired several arrows in his direction. Grant only had a moment to look up and see the attacks headed his way, but a moment, it seemed, was all that he needed. His right foot still on Harold's back, Grant reached up with his left hand, and for a moment his whole left arm seemed to just be vibrating. It was yet another feat that no fighter in that town could have duplicated, and when Grant's arms stopped vibrating, they could see that there were six arrows in his grip. A warrior doesn't leave himself open to attacks from other sides. Grant shouted angrily, flinging the arrows back through the air in the direction of Antoine and the other soldiers of Arryn. 